One of the first things Israel did after Hamas burst out of Gaza, killing over 1,400 Israelis and taking around 200 hostages, was bomb two Syrian airports. Syria said Thursday that Israeli missiles had targeted airports in Damascus and Aleppo. Confused? Yeah, well, it's confusing. Syria's a long way from Gaza. Hamas doesn't have a base in Syria. And Syria isn't really in a position to threaten Israel very much. It's barely functioning after more than a decade of civil war. So why bomb these airports? It's because they're used to supply the most powerful unofficial military force in the world, Hezbollah. Now, Israel's confident that they can defeat Hamas. But Hezbollah is a whole different matter. And they're allies of Hamas. If Hezbollah joins Hamas, it'll be a nightmare for Israel. So in our third episode on the Israel-Gaza war, who is Hezbollah? How did they form? It turns out it's because of Israel and an eerily similar conflict 40 years ago. Has Israel learned anything since then? I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. The story of the birth of Hezbollah is one that begins not in Gaza, not in Israel, not even in Iran, but in Lebanon. Lebanon's geography is, in comparison with other Middle Eastern countries, extremely strange. In a region dominated by wide, open desert expanses, 81% of Lebanon is covered by mountains, about the same proportion as Switzerland and Nepal. But aside from providing good skiing conditions, these mountains have had an interesting effect on Lebanon's population. See, mountains keep people apart. And over thousands of years, the people living in the valleys of Lebanon have developed incredibly diverse cultures. It's the most religiously diverse country in the Middle East, by far. More or less evenly balanced between Christians and the two major branches of Islam, Sunni and Shia. Most Muslims around the world are Sunni, and Shiites are often marginalised. Only 15% are Shiites. And Iran is the only Muslim country led by a Shiite, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Sunnis and Shiites do not always get along. Historically, the division between Sunnis and Shiites has led to intense conflict, which has at times erupted in war. But in Lebanon, the mountains have separated these groups. You have to be a lot angrier to attack someone over a mountain than across a plain. This has maintained a centuries-long balance, a balance they now attempt to reflect in their politics. The president of Lebanon is always a Christian. The Prime Minister is always a Sunni Muslim. The Speaker of the House is always a Shia Muslim. There are quotas for how many MPs each sect gets. It's all based on what the population of each group was the last time they held a census, which was in 1932. They're worried that a new census will change the ratios, so they just don't do censuses. Your count can't be wrong if you never count. This is how it was for decades. There were a few exceptions, but mostly there was harmony in Lebanon. But in the 1970s, something rapidly changed. Palestinian refugees, pushed out by civil war with Israel and with nowhere else to turn, began arriving in enormous numbers in Lebanon. Palestinians are human beings. And they are living in Lebanon because of Israel and because they have been driven up by force. Almost all Palestinians are Sunni Muslims, and this began to upset the balance. Lebanon's balance between Christians, Shiites and Sunnis now began to tip rapidly towards the Sunnis. Before long, Lebanon erupted into a horrific civil war. And just to make things worse, as Lebanese communities attacked each other, a group of Palestinians called the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO, started using Lebanon as a base for attacks on Israel. Prime Minister Begin claims 
more than 150 Israelis have been assassinated on the country's northern border during the last 12 months by PLO guerrillas in southern Lebanon. By 1982, Israel decided it was time to end it. They would go all the way to the Lebanese capital, Beirut, and take out the PLO once and for all. It was the beginning of Lebanon's hot, dry summer when Israel invaded. The speed and savagery of this latest Israeli offensive into Lebanon has shocked countries around the world. The Israelis swept through southern Lebanon towards the capital, Beirut, where the PLO leadership was holed up. Remember, there was also a civil war going on, and now Israeli tanks were on the city's doorstep. People ran for cover every time they heard the Israelis overhead. Usually crowded streets were deserted. The people are terrified. The effects of the invasion were horrific. Lebanese civilians and Palestinian refugees were killed en masse as Israeli forces swept through the country. What started out as a punitive raid into Lebanon four weeks ago has turned into what some are calling the brutal final solution to the Palestinian problem. They reached Beirut and put the city under siege, blockading food, water and electricity and flattening apartment buildings with airstrikes and artillery fire. At the very centre of this siege was the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organisation, Yasser Arafat. Arafat said the Palestinians would fight to the last bullet. Appearing to relish such a prospect, he urged the Israelis to attack, saying his men were ready. He knew that he was Israel's enemy number one and that his life was at risk. Arafat is a man constantly on the move. He knows that much of West Beirut is under direct observation by the Israelis. Oddly enough, he didn't seem all that put off by the spies and the airstrikes. As the city became a war zone, Arafat seemed to be in his element. Arafat toured besieged Beirut with a smile on his face, kissing babies, cracking jokes as he visited the men fighting on his side. One of the reasons he's popular with his fighters is that he makes periodic inspections like this one. He even looked like a rock star. The Australian Women's Weekly published an article about how much he resembled Ringo Starr. As bombs rained down on Beirut and Israeli troops drew the net closer and closer around him, he happily gave interviews and talked about how much he was looking forward to becoming an engineer once the nation of Palestine was established and he could go home to Jerusalem. I would like uh, to work as an engineer. It is my profession. Despite Israeli spies on the ground calling in airstrikes directly against him, Arafat stayed alive. If the Israelis invade West Beirut, what will your troops do? Hmm. What do you expect me to do? The scene in Beirut was extremely similar to the one we're seeing today in Gaza. Israeli tanks waiting at the gates to a city, destroying neighbourhoods with airstrikes, trying to eliminate a Palestinian group. Today, Israeli forces were still poised outside Beirut, ready to deliver the final death blow to the Palestine Liberation Organisation. Israel's international allies watched on in horror as the siege dragged into a second month. Finally, they'd had enough. The US President Ronald Reagan sent in Team America to end the siege. The government of Lebanon has requested, and I have approved, the deployment of United States forces to Beirut as part of a multinational force. Arafat, without his headscarf, and thousands of PLO fighters left Beirut on ships, having withstood the Israeli siege for 10 weeks. He called it a victory, heralding a new dawn in the Arab world, and left to set up new operations in Tunisia. Now, you might be thinking, Okay, interesting story, but what does any of this have to do with Hezbollah? And I would agree, it is an interesting story. And I would tell you that the time that I'll tell you about Hezbollah is now. If you know anything about Hezbollah, it's probably that they're backed by Iran. So let's talk about Iran, shall we? Iran is a Middle Eastern superpower with a massive population. Like Lebanon, it's mountainous and has a long history and strong culture. But it's the black sheep of the family. It's never really fit in. The Islamic revolution in Iran depends for its momentum 
on regular expressions of unity. The leaders of the newly formed Islamic Republic of Iran watched the attack by Israel with interest, and they saw an opportunity. You see, finding allies is kind of difficult for them. They were Shia Muslims, hardline Islamic fundamentalists, and Persians. And most people in the Middle East are none of those things. But there are Shiites in Lebanon, and they were mighty annoyed with the Israelis. So Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard Corps got to work uniting Shiites who do not like Israel, who live in Lebanon, into one group. And they gave it a name. Hezbollah, the party of God, the most fanatical of Lebanon's Shiite Muslims, are now firmly, openly and successfully established in Beirut. Ehud Barak, a top Israeli military official who went on to become the Israeli Prime Minister, later said, when we entered Lebanon, there was no Hezbollah. We were accepted by perfumed rice and flowers by the Shia in the south. It was our presence there that created Hezbollah. Hezbollah has undergone a massive transformation since the siege of Beirut. They started off as a fairly typical terrorist organisation. For eight years, they carried out bombings, kidnappings and hijackings. It was Hezbollah that destroyed the American marine barracks in Beirut, killing some 240 people and producing scenes of the most awful carnage. They were famous for running through the streets covered in blood after conducting a ritual which involves cutting your head open with a sword and then hitting the wound over and over with your hand. Unlike most Palestinian terrorists who prefer to get away, Hezbollah welcome death, and this makes them more dangerous. Once the Lebanese civil war ended in 1990, Hezbollah gave themselves a bit of a makeover. The Muslim fundamentalist group Hezbollah has had unexpected success in the country's first general election for 20 years. With funding directly from Iran, they spent big to build the support of Shia communities. The party of God has courted the people lavishly in the run-up to Lebanon's elections. It's built new mosques, funded schools and clinics, and handed out cash to the needy. Since 1992, they've won seats at every Lebanese election. Since 2012, they've had seats in Cabinet. A Hezbollah MP has been the Sports Minister of Lebanon for most of the last decade. Hezbollah also owns a radio and TV station. They provide social services and run a tourism operation. We like it here very much. It's peaceful. But one aspect of Hezbollah hasn't changed. Since the very beginning, they've been devoted to the elimination of the State of Israel. It's something symbolised in their logo. An arm holds a machine gun in the air. Officials say that is a threat to Israel. The machine gun for Israel. And will continue to be a machine gun for Israel. For this, they have a military wing. And they are a real and terrifying threat to Israel. Armed by Iran, they are said to be the best equipped non-government military force in the world. Their military wing is apparently more powerful than the Lebanese army. Thanks to Lebanon's geography, Hezbollah is apparently kind of like an iceberg. You only see the very tip. This is Hezbollah territory. It's covered in deep valleys perfect for waging guerrilla war and deep caves perfect for housing fighters and arms. For four decades now, they've been attacking Israel with rockets and raids. Israel has struck back against Hezbollah guerrillas in the latest round of tit-for-tat attacks in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah sits there in its mountain fortress, looming over Israel's northern border like a giant dam that could burst at any moment and flood into Israel. And that's what Israel's worried about. That's what Israel's allies and even some of its enemies are worried about. If the dam bursts, it would significantly escalate the scale of the current war. But Israel's Prime Minister warned Hezbollah and its sponsor Iran not to get involved. In Hezbollah, if Hezbollah decides to enter the war, they'll be making the biggest mistake of their lives and hit with unimaginable force. Since the Hamas attack in early October, skirmishes have begun at the foot of the mountains. Hezbollah has fired rockets. Israel has responded with airstrikes. 
Israel bombed the airports in Syria, which are known to be part of the supply chain from Iran to Hezbollah. So why hasn't Hezbollah launched an attack? What are they waiting for? Well, the thing about a dam bursting is it takes a while for the dam to fill up again. For their Iranian backers, Hezbollah is most effective as a spectre, a threat. They do not have the strength to defeat Israel, and they may be defeated themselves, and then the threat's no longer there. But Hezbollah should also serve as a reminder for Israel. The current siege of Gaza is incredibly reminiscent of the failed siege of Beirut 40 years ago. Our military armour continues to pound away at the strongholds of the 6,000 strong PLO force trapped inside the city. The group they were trying to eliminate escaped. And as an unintended consequence, Hezbollah, an even more dangerous group, arose. That unintended consequence is still looming down on Israel from the Lebanese mountains. What will the unintended consequence be this time?